Salam, everybody. My name is Muhammad Ali. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Relations here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I've got an exciting event planned. I believe it's the first, if not one of the first, bi-coastal events. And uh, depending on where Horace is, it may be even uh, larger than that. Um, we have headquartered our, uh, our Los Angeles uh, is our headquarters, and we've got uh, a few folks there. We've got Usma and I in our DC policy headquarters here in Washington, DC. And um, we will we'll get started. So about a decade or so ago, I was uh, an advisor in the United States Senate. And um, I was uh, working for Senator Al Franken, who represents uh, re represented Minnesota, and which is home to one of the largest Somali populations in the world. One of the things that kind of really just struck me and shook me at the time and has stayed with me is a number of meetings that we had with Somali Americans who were coming in and talking about sort of the tre uh, treasury uh, regulatory system, the OFAC regulatory system, which made it very difficult to remit money back to Somalia without running afoul of some of the sanctions regime that was in place. Basically, they wanted to send money back to their loved ones, but were fearful of in doing so, would they run afoul of the law, which would then impact how they are being able to live in the United States. Um, it was meeting after meeting after meeting. And at the end of it, after many, many months of it, it was their conclusion was, you know what, we can just take a dollar shy of $10,000 in cash and go to Somalia. Each one of us can do it. And if that is the most effective way, then let's just go about it that way. That was their take. That was mind boggling and baffling to me. And so then, you know, when, when Kabul fell and the Taliban had retaken their, uh, that area, the, the country, it, something similar struck to me where, again, we have a former ally that you know a lot of a lot of the people there were helpful to us throughout the last 20 years and they need our help they need our money they need our support and there is desire to send that money from the united states to people's loved ones their family but also in general people who want to just send 250 dollars 300 dollars or 400 dollars whatever it might be just in zakat and khums or just in charity not specific to an individual but they feel nervous doing so so I wanted to put this event together and we've brought together a panel of experts who are able to kind of uh, navigate and um, share their experiences as how to ensure that people who want to do this should feel secure in doing so. Um, so the event is going to be, Asma is going to speak first, then we have a video, um, then we'll have uh, Farid and then Haris speak. And then in between the panelists are able to you know, ask questions as necessary. And then participants, um, you guys are also, you know, feel free to ask questions as you'd like. Um, I'll go now to a quick intro for everybody, starting with Dr. Farid uh, Sinzai. He is the founder and president of Afghan Relief and is a native of Afghanistan, committed to helping the most vulnerable people in his home country. And he's worked extensively with multiple organizations and uh, he's been a leader on US relationships with uh, the Muslim world. Then we have uh, Haris Tareen, who is the uh, Chief of Staff for Operations, Operation Allies Welcome. He was actually previously the director of the Washington, D.C. office at MPAC. Um, and he's been a contributor to CNN, BBC, Fox News, MSNBC, basically any news source of relevance. He's been uh, he's been, um, you know, offering his uh, insight. But I do want to note that he is joining us in his personal capacity. Um, but first, I want to uh, kick it to Asma, who's, you know, she's she's a young emerging Afghan leader and her resume is so, so detailed, so vivid that I couldn't ever do it justice. So Asma, with that, I will uh, kick it to you. Great. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, so my name is Asma Mohammadi. I'm an Afghan American. I'm attending American University Washington College of Law, pursuing my JD as well as my master's in international affairs. Uh, prior to law school, I received my bachelor's degree in political science and global studies from Nazareth College. And throughout my undergraduate studies, um, I was able to intern at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Afghanistan. Um, my passion has always lied in helping uplift Afghans in any way that I was capable. Having grown up in a post 9-11 era and witnessing what was happening to Afghanistan, uh, specifically to women and girls, I felt a moral responsibility to change in whatever capacity I could what was going on. My educational and professional studies um, have all been geared towards that goal. And as my educational career has progressed, I have watched Afghans 
and Afghan women suffer even more. Uh, so since, since last August and throughout my, my career in law school, I have been able to work at State Department under, under the CARE project. I just completed uh, an internship with USAID. And um, I think, uh, you know, as my educational career has progressed, and especially since last August, uh, the whole world has watched 20 years of progressive efforts by the United States and by um, nations worldwide fall flat as the Taliban uh, took over Afghanistan. So in early August last year, I watched Afghanistan fall province by province to the Taliban. I don't think anybody really believed what was happening, but I think that everybody had a lot of hope for Kabul, right? So in the, in the beginning weeks of August of last year, uh, we saw uh, every province fall, but it wasn't until August 15th when the Taliban stormed the presidential palace that I think all hope was lost and everybody started to rush uh, to the Kabul airport. And I think the worst part of all of that was seeing all the images uh, from various news outlets come out of families who were who were at the airport and who were struggling to to make it to planes. Um, you know, we saw images and videos of Afghans who were literally clinging onto aircraft out of fear of what their future would look like in Afghanistan if, if they had stayed. It was a few days. Um, after August 15th, when Afghans started to arrive at Dulles Airport. And as soon as I found out, I was there. There were dozens of Afghan Americans who showed up to help in any capacity possible. And um, as I explained to my law school peers as I began the semester, um, what I was doing at night, they were blown away by the fact that I was dedicating all of my free time to something like this. But what they didn't know is that all Afghans Americans were showing up to help in any capacity possible. Um, there were, I, I was amazed to listen to, you know, what people had going on in their day jobs and their family responsibilities, but they were still showing up for 12 hour shifts to help welcome thousands of Afghans at Dulles. Um, so I, I witnessed a lot when I was at Dulles, uh, you know, there were people, hundreds of people who were coming off planes, their travels sometimes took like about seven days from camping out at the airport in Kabul and then their experiences at Doha or at other um, airports before arriving to the United States. And I wanna preface that like nothing can capture the tragedy that Afghans endured and continue to endure. Uh, these are just some of the things that, that I saw and some of the things that I experienced. Um, my first few hours at Dulles, when I arrived, I was sent to help the unaccompanied minors. Uh, and in this area of the airport, it was a little less chaotic. They had identified children who had gone onto, onto these planes um, all by themselves. And uh, there were children as young as like six and eight in that room. And I listened to each child's story talk about how they arrived at the airport with their entire family. And in the chaos, they all got separated. And now he was in a foreign land. Most of them had you know, no cell phone. Uh, they had no ability to contact their family to let them know that they were safe. So uh, a lot of the volunteers were just struggling to try and find some sort of contact to connect them with their family. Uh, a lot of other people came in with medical emergencies uh, of various kinds. There were women who experienced miscarriages on the planes um, and they needed medical attention. I was on many ambulance rides from the airport to the hospital. Uh, you know, the, the ambulances were mostly made up of male personnel and they did not have translators. Uh, so it was on the volunteers and, and the translators who were at the airport to, to escort them there and try and get them the help that they needed. I also, uh, there was a man who came who literally had a bullet in his hand that was left untreated. Uh, there were so many children who were like, clearly very, very hungry and needed like water and, and baby food and a lot of other supplies. Uh, thankfully, World Central Kitchen was there and, and provided hot meals to the Afghans uh, about a week after the operation started at Dulles and we were able to get them uh, some of the help that they needed. One thing that I'll never forget uh, during my time at Dulles was, uh, so 
and the plane would land, we would get some sort of notice about how many people would be coming in. They would go through some sort of customs um, and then they would be, they would be brought into uh, like COVID testing and we would try and give them whatever they needed, whether that was medical attention, food, water, uh, COVID tests um, and, and other things. And, you know, there was a uh, about 800 people who were coming in for this particular flight. And uh, in the beginning, they try and push forward those who needed that kind of medical attention. Um, and there was a baby who was just like, I will, I will never forget this baby's cry. Um, I have a lot of younger siblings and, and cousins. So I've, I've, I've heard a lot of babies cry, but you could tell by the way that he was crying that he was too, so thirsty. Like you could feel how dry his throat was. And I, I talked to the mother and I was like, you know, has he had anything? And she said that she was unable to feed the baby because she hasn't had anything to eat or drink in like over 36 hours. And um, the, baby, the baby was screaming. At the time at the airport, I think we had run out of baby formula and there was, there was nothing that really could have been done. Um, so I had to like rush and I literally had to get a, a baby bottle and put water in it and, and feed this baby with just, you know, droplets of, of water. And the other children too, you know, they just had witnessed so much, everything that they had grown to learn and love their families was just ripped from them in a matter, in a matter of days. And, you know, just being there and being able to help in any capacity possible was very meaningful to me and very rewarding, but also very painful to see um, my people who have suffered for so many years, for decades, and then for them to have to go through all of this uh, just to end up uh, here. And you know, over the past year, I think their, their struggle has only just begun, right? Learning a new language, learning the ins and outs of society, um, and you know, getting a job and, and learning how to adjust to American culture and American society overall. So it was, it was a very overwhelming time, but I think it has motivated me more in my studies and in um, my dedication to this type of work, which is why after, after the operation in Dulles ended, um, I think I was even more dedicated and more motivated to continue to um, help support Afghans in any way possible. I have, I have sensed, like I mentioned before, I, I joined the State Department with the CARE Project uh, to help bring over um, other Afghans who have worked uh, closely with Americans to the United States. Um, in addition to that, um, I am doing a fellowship with Conservation X Labs, which is also attempting to bring over um, Afghans who have who have served the American government as well as other international organizations such as the United Nations um, to come over here. I've volunteered with the various amount of churches who have sponsored Afghan families to try and make this transition as easy as possible. Um, so thank you so much uh, for having me on this panel. And I think we're gonna be taking questions at the end. So I'll turn it back over to Mohammed. Um, actually, I, I do have one question. You had mentioned the work that you have done, and that's remarkable and incredible, and and frankly, just you know, it, it's it's tear jerking. But are, is there a network of folks who are in college or in school of of young Afghans or otherwise who can coalesce and come together to figure out best practices on how to help those who are here? Um, you know, Afghans who are around your age who they need to build a life for themselves and they need to be transitioning into schools and into, um, you know, places where they can eventually and inshallah thrive. Is there something like that going on right now? Yeah, I think every local community has uh, something like that. Um, and in the DMV area, I know that there's like, uh, they're doing like a, a school drive and they're helping, you know, kids with school supplies and stuff like that to get them started for the year. I think that's going to be uh, in a few weeks. Um, and I think uh, they have the Afghan American conference that they recently held a few months ago and they have kind of their headquarters. There's like one in New York, there's a DMV area one and one in LA. And it is, it's made up of a bunch of volunteers who have, you know, dedicated their time last year to this kind of effort and they have also been following up to to try and work with some of uh, I think some of the social services that various uh, towns and counties 
uh, just to have a, a coalition of people who can help make this transition as easy as possible. Uh, there's also, um, I mentioned this, there's also the app called A Seal, which uh, has been doing work in terms of helping giving Afghans work in Afghanistan, right? And then selling their products uh, via this app. And that's another way that you can, you can support kind of locally for anything that you need, whether it's a carpet or, or other products, but it's a sustainable way to support those overseas and then as well as in the, in the community. That's really helpful to know, and thank you for sharing that. I think that that goes to the crux of what we're trying to accomplish here, is making sure that not just the Afghans who are here are taken care of, but the ones who are still in Afghanistan and perhaps do not want to or cannot come to the United States or anywhere else are also financially taken care of. And you know, another thing that I was thinking about is making sure that there is perhaps some mentorship program where you have Afghans who have, you know, you gotten to a degree of success, whatever that may be, or however you define success, to kind of create a, a mentorship or that sort of relationship with those who are just getting here, right? They always say, or oftentimes it's said that the first generation is here, they have to be the ones to survive and make sure that the next generation can actually thrive. So I, you know, obviously you're you're already doing that. So I appreciate your your efforts. And Harris or or anybody in the LA office, do you guys have any questions for Asma? Obviously we're gonna have an opportunity to do so towards the end as well. And if not, let's go to the next portion of our program, which is actually a video um, from Masuda Sultan. She's the uh, founder and CEO of Symbio Investments, and she's actually the co-founder of Women for Afghan Women um, and has been published a number of times in The New York Times. Um, and she wanted to be here. She was we were hoping that she could, but she was not able to be here in person or over Zoom. So she sent in a video um, and I believe the L.A. office is going to be putting that up. And if not, I can share screen and do that. Actually, you know, there is a question. Um, Asma, can you see that question? It's in the Q&A section, bottom right. Yeah, let me uh, just read it quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think that right now, this is speaking to a number of them have already committed crimes and, and all that. I think when it comes to, uh, you know, ensuring that there's a degree of humanity that we're presenting, it might be a good idea to discuss those things once basic security, basic human security needs are being met. Um, and it's not so much that they're trying to escape their Muslim countries who emigrate here. It's that we were the ones that put them in a position that they're in right now. They supported us for 20 years because we had, um, you know, we wanted to come in and adjust the nature of that country. And, and they, they gave up their security, that the security that they're lacking right now, it's because they supported us. So when somebody does something like that, you have to ensure their security. That's what we're trying to do. And still, this isn't about national security. This isn't about foreign policy. This is about human basic, the basic humanity that we all share, regardless of faith, regardless of anything else. So Carl, I appreciate your question, but I think that that's something that we can discuss at a different time, but let's just make sure that we are focusing on the basic, the, the basic humanity that we all share. Um, now let's go on to the the video from Masuda, and um, let's let's get that going. Um, and I will pull up that video and uh, do a screen share. It is now the one year anniversary of the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. How is the country faring? Not well. There's a mass hunger crisis. 90% of people don't have enough to eat and half the population is surviving on one meal a day. And while famine was largely averted last winter due to the efforts of the US and other donors uh, making donations to the WFP, um, winter is approaching again and it doesn't look good. The WFP says donations are down, food prices are up, and only 8% of the country is expected to get food rations. This is a humanitarian disaster driven in large part by an economic crisis. When the US left Afghanistan, so did um, over 80% of Afghanistan's budget. The country spiraled um, w economically with uh, over 900,000 jobs being lost um, with um, the central bank reserves of the country being seized, 
um, so that bank liquidity was crushed um, and there's been a shortage of cash, both US dollars and Afghani. Um, and, you know, yesterday there was a letter to President Biden from um, 70 top economists, including Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, urging a return of Afghanistan's assets. Uh, as you may know, $7 billion of central bank reserves that were in the New York Fed had been frozen when the Taliban took over. And later, through an executive order, half of those assets um, are meant to be for the benefit of the Afghan people, and they're still being negotiated with Afghanistan um, uh, for a mechanism to return them for central bank functions, such as currency auctions uh, and the like. And the second three and a half billion are now caught up in a court case in New York. 9-11 um, families are suing for uh, those funds, um, and that is an ongoing matter. Um, but the Taliban are not helping either. Human Rights Watch reports that there's also a human rights crisis. Um, Taliban have broken multiple pledges to respect human rights and women's rights, um, and there's been a, a rollback on those rights. Um, Afghan women are in deep peril. Um, and as we all know, Afghan girls are still uh, essentially barred from attending secondary school in most of the country. Um, public schools for uh, girls' high schools are still not opened, um, except for about five or six provinces. So what can be done? Um, one of the things we need to do is urge um, our countries to uh, the United States to donate more to Afghanistan. The UN pledge at 4.4 billion is only half funded. Um, and I said, uh, uh, as I said, WFP donations are down. Um, secondly, we need a return of Afghanistan central bank reserves for the functioning of the central bank. Those currency auctions need to happen. The currency needs to be stabilized. While there's a worldwide food shortage, food prices are going up. That is uh, adversely affecting um, the Afghan people's ability to uh, return to a sense of normal. But really, um, the central bank reserves and the, and the freezing of Afghanistan's assets uh, means that central bank functions can't be carried out. And no matter how much humanitarian assistance you give, Afghanistan is still going to be in a crisis. And so that is one area of focus that we need to urge our government to continue working on and finding a way to assist Afghanistan with those functions. Um, and lastly, of course, um, uh, is individual donations and assistance that people can provide. Um, so I'm really proud to partner with uh, Professor Farid Sanzai and Afghan Relief and working um, on Abad, Afghan Women Forward uh, project together. Um, I believe that uh, every little bit counts. And while we look at the bigger policy issues, that anything you can give, um, whether it's um, a, a, a dollar for food or whether it's help to Afghan women to get through what is going to be a very difficult winter this year, um, I think that those, um, those efforts, that kind of charity is very much needed and will make a difference. Thank you. So one of the things that I found to be very interesting based on what we just heard and based on what we heard from Usma is, well, a lot of times what we hear is this kind of sense of, you know, nothing good is happening, everything is bad. And and, and obviously that is, every. we all kind of know that. We all know that things are, are, are really not, the, the Afghan people have not been treated in the right way. What has happened in the last year is not a positive thing, but there are some silver linings. And Usman, what was the name of the app you had mentioned? It's called a seal. I can put a link for it in the in the chat as well. So and that'd be wonderful. And I think that that is representative of ingenuity and entrepreneurship to help those help themselves, right? It's something that we are trying to facilitate folks to be able to create a better life for them there. And there has been conversations about, you had mentioned ASPA, where there's, you know, there's peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. There are other programs to, that are helped to design those, those folks who have come here as a result of all that has happened. So I think while there is this feeling of, you know, things not going well, and of course that's undeniable, I, you know, the, the fact that there are so many people willing to help, wanting to help is kind of the nature of this discussion, is the fact that there is desire to support financially and otherwise, but there's just sometimes that missing linkage is representative of the fact that, um, you know, that's, that, that there's something to be, you know, to be had. And, and next I'll go to uh, LA, uh, to Dr. Fritz and Zai, and um, we'll, we'll go there. Well, thank you for that, Mohammed. Um, you know, this week has been uh, a week of reflection. I mean, 
you you look um, across the country, there are a number of events, activities happening, um, assessing where we are uh, over the past year. Many of them are uh, uh, political engagements, discussions about um, what has transpired over the past 12 months. Uh, it's a it's a one year anniversary for us to look back and see uh, have things gone well or not. I mean, I think the, the stories that that both Asma and Masuda shared uh, of what Afghanistan has gone through is clearly a painful story. It's a story of a country that's been devastated by war for the past 40 years, uh, a country that is trying to uh, to come together, a, a country that is trying to 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 rebuild. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the Taliban taking over, um, for many, uh, there was some level of hope that, you know, the war was over, the U.S. had pulled out, and therefore could, uh, could the Taliban, uh, taking over the entire country, could they bring some semblance of security to, to the country? Um, and, uh, and have they, in fact, changed? since the 90s, and so there was discussion about that, the extent to which the Taliban have changed their views uh, from what they had uh, in the 90s. And so that debate was taking place. I think now, a, a year later, we can look back and assess what has happened, where are we, uh, what have they done, what have they done right, what have they done wrong, um, how can we move forward from here. Uh, the Taliban uh, has one primary goal. Their priority is uh, internal cohesion. Their, their goal is to make sure that internally there is cohesion within, within the group. And therefore, many other things that transpire and come out of that are a reflection of their constant emphasis and desire for internal cohesion, um, and and we can we can look at specific examples of uh, decisions that the Taliban have made over the past year that have a been a reflection of that desire for internal uh, cohesion. You know, the decision about girls' education and not allowing for girls to go to school was an internal debate that was taking place within the Taliban. The vast majority of the Taliban have, in fact, wanted and insisted that girls should all return to school. And many of them were under the assumption that that would happen. But yet, uh, it was a decision made by the emir, the person at the very top of the organization. This is Hibatullah Ahunzada, who is the emir sort of the supreme leader, in some ways equivalent to the Ayatollah Khomeini and, and uh, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, excuse me, in, in Iran, um, who basically, in the very last second, in the 11th hour, made the decision that school, the girls would not return to school. And then you had a unification across, even though there's internal divisions there, but yet the Taliban came together to say that the emir has spoken and therefore we are going to hold our dissent or disagreement with, with this, this view. So as I said, the Taliban have insisted on trying to maintain this internal cohesion. And there are divisions, as we said, among the different factions within, uh, within the Taliban. Um, politically, they have um, there was hope initially when they took, took over that there would be a more inclusive government, that they would bring in other segments of the Afghan population. As many of you know, Afghanistan is a very diverse country, ethnically, religiously, linguistically. There are many different groups. Uh, and yet, that hope was dashed when the Taliban um, essentially brought in all former Taliban uh, fighters uh, into the government and gave them top positions. Uh, and in many ways, it was individuals that had 
certain level of seniority within the Taliban that took the most important uh, positions. And so it did not uh, bring in the diverse array of ethnic groups within, within the country. Uh, and they are, of course, ethnically predominantly Pashtun. And therefore, even though they have some token figures from, from other ethnic groups, they're predominantly Pashtun um, that are dominating the, 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 the current government. So politically, that has been very discouraging that what many people hoped for a much more inclusive government turned out not to be the case. Um, the economic front is the second, is that, you know, uh, clearly there are external factors. The sanctions, as Masuda uh, uh, very eloquently pointed out, that the sanctions have been devastating. But the sanctions were in place before the Taliban uh, took over, and therefore they just got reasserted. But it was interesting, this is one of the few times where sanctions against the Taliban, a group external or outside of the government, now takes over the government, and now you've got sanctions in place against not only the Taliban, but individuals, uh, leaders that, uh, you know, uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, for instance, has a bounty on, on his head, and there are sanctions then directly against uh, uh, the government. Um, the Federal Reserve deposit, as Masood again pointed out, was another devastating blow. This is $9.4 billion that were uh, uh, the reserves that the Afghan Central Bank has held and has allowed for the economy to function as well as provide liquidity uh, for the, the banking system, but yet unfortunately that has been uh, sanctioned and restricted. And you know, two two and a half billion of that is in Europe, but about seven seven billion is in, in New York, in the United States. And that uh, has been devastating. So we talk about these decisions from external factors that have impacted uh, the internal um, uh, economy within the country. And it's been really devastating. You know, I think Masuda did a wonderful job of outlining what this has done for average Afghans across the country uh, when these reserves have been, um, have been held. Uh, with it, of course, it's been a devastating impact on the economy as a whole. There's no clear um, statistics on what how much the economy has shrunk, but clearly has shrunk significantly. Um, by some estimates, as much as 50%, it's contracted. So the economy has contracted by 50%. Imagine an economy being half of what it was. What does that lead to? Well, it leads to devastating consequences for the labor market, for job opportunities, people are unemployed, they don't have uh, access to incomes, uh, and the poverty level has then consequently gone up dramatically. You know, where some suggest that uh, somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of the population is living in poverty. I mean, just imagine 50 to 80 percent poverty level, where some statistics uh, uh, according to the UN suggests that 95 to 97 percent of the country does not have enough uh, to eat and consume uh, on, a, on a daily basis, uh, where parents are foregoing meals uh, so that their children can eat, uh, where a million children are at, uh, at the brink of starvation and acute levels of food insecurity uh, are rampant uh, uh, across the country. I mean, imagine to the point where you hear these these horrific stories of parents selling their 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 daughters and these child brides that are sold in out, out of desperation in many cases, where where they they have children that they need to feed, and the only way they can feed their children is in order to uh, to sell their uh, to sell their daughters uh, and mind you, for very, very small amounts, just so that they can get by for another month um, 
And you know, these aren't long-term solutions. These are obviously short-term uh, uh, efforts to feed their families. In some cases, you see these, in Herat, for instance, you see these uh, examples of people giving away their organs. They're literally giving away organs in order to, uh, to get food uh, for their, their family. Um, and then third, tied in with all of this, is the international issues and international relations. Clearly, uh, they have been compounded. So the political dynamic that hasn't led to an inclusive government has obviously uh, tarnished uh, its relationship internationally because internationally people, other countries have felt that the, that the Taliban should have been far more inclusive in forming their government. Uh, the uh, the uh, economic sanctions have compounded that in terms of their ability to trade uh, internationally. We can talk more specifically about what that has entailed in terms of trade relations with, with both uh, regional countries as well as uh, the United States and, and others. Um, uh, but the international effort in terms of its relationships have been devastated at its core because of this decision about not letting girls go to school, which was in March. Uh, many were hopeful that in March schools would open and girls would be able to go to school. And that devastating decision to not let girls go to school uh, was, was very difficult. Uh, and it was very difficult, of course, uh, not only for Afghan girls, but, but difficult in terms of the devastating impact it had for the way the international community then sought to view Afghanistan. There was, in fact, Tom West, who was leading this effort on behalf of the, the U.S. government, um, said that that was a turning point where there was a, a tremendous amount of interest in providing aid and the UN and the EU, for instance, was was in a concerted effort trying to raise $4.5 billion. Uh, and they were, my understanding is, very close to getting a tremendous amount of support internationally. And all of that essentially came to a halt after that decision to not let girls go to school. So that was an internal decision that Taliban made which had devastating consequences internationally in terms of how then the international community then began to view uh, how to move forward uh, with, with Afghanistan. Um, the, uh, the, the license given, uh, and I think Harris will talk more about that in terms of the U.S.'s relationship, you know, there have been some licenses given for humanitarian assistance, and so you begin to see people uh, since February and organizations internationally, the IRC and, Af and um, um, Islamic Relief and many other relief organizations, including the one that we run, Afghan Relief, uh, has, has feel, felt more comfortable providing aid and assistance uh, to Afghanistan because of those uh, licenses and those uh, uh, releases that the government has given. But there's a, uh, there's a uh, cooling effect uh, a chilling effect, I should say, that takes place where other countries are still hesitant. I mean, nobody's going to begin to invest in Afghanistan uh, if there's fear of how this would be viewed, uh, especially if it's seen as, in some ways, aiding or abetting the Taliban government. And so governments are, are hesitant to invest heavily. Uh, even countries that may have given lip service to wanting to invest uh, they have still, for the most part, been hesitant uh, to do that. And then finally, in, in terms of the, the, the devastating uh, consequences uh, in terms of internationally that uh, is viewed was the Zawahiri, the Ayman al-Zawahiri uh, bombing. Uh, this is a, the founder of al-Qaeda with Osama bin Laden is physically in Kabul and is living in the house of the interior minister. I mean... What could be more devastating for a government than to, to have 20 years ago uh, housed uh, Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri, from which we ended up with 
the September 11th attacks and we have the the devastating war for the past 20 years only to find two decades later that Ayman al-Zawahiri is alive and has come back to to Afghanistan. I mean, clearly that left. Professor, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Sure. You mentioned housing and you mentioned somebody, you know, somebody of that nature living in a prominent home and, and mentioned some of the governmental assistance. And I know my colleague here in DC, Usma, had a question about, you know, non-governmental aid, person to person. And, and, and so I'll, I'll give the give the floor to Usma before you continue on with what you're sharing. Yeah, um, Farid, I just wanted to know uh, what your uh, thoughts and advice on for people, regular individuals, right, who are wanting to help um, Avians both abroad and domestically. So what are what are some ways that they can go about that and not have any fear that it's going to get into the wrong hands, you know, that it's going to actually um, help people, whether that's feeding people or providing some sort of um, educational stipend for uh, women and girls. Uh, like, like Masuda talked about before, there's a humanitarian crisis in terms of lack of food and, and food prices um, becoming extremely overwhelming. So I just want to know uh, if you can share that with with, with the audience and, and with me as well to know what resources are there to help provide um, you know, financial assistance. Like if I wanted to send $20 or if I have the capability of doing something monthly or I feel the urgency to help support Afghans domestically and abroad, what are, what's out there and, and what can I do to make sure that that money is getting into, into the right hands? And, and well, more, that's an excellent. Oh, and, and more specifically, $250, for example, is not a small chunk of change, but it's not something that many of us would have to sell an organ in order to kind of even out our own budget. But, you know, what does that buy and how does that get dispensed and dispersed and how does that get spent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's been a tremendous outpouring of support uh, for, for Afghanistan and every dollar makes a difference. I mean, it's remarkable what a small amount can, can do. Um, I mean, when we started Afghan Relief, this was a personal effort. I mean, I felt as an Afghan American living here in the United States, having a comfortable life, that I wanted to do something to help Afghanistan. And I think there's been a uh, so many, I mean, thousands of Afghan Americans. You know, Asma did a nice job of outlining the kind of support that she's been involved with. But there's been so many individuals like this that have wanted wanted to help. Well, I did the same thing that I was wanted to help individually. I felt like I should do something, even a small amount. And so I started Afghan Relief. I had registered the organization. And my initial goal were relatively limited in terms of what I thought would happen. But it was remarkable the amount of outpouring of support that, that came out. And so the organization grew very quickly. Now we have, in fact, staff in Afghanistan, people on the ground in different provinces helping um, the immediate needs of those that are most vulnerable. In fact, our goal is how can we help the most vulnerable in Afghanistan? We initially supported orphans and widows. We've expanded that to the earthquake, for instance, that happened in the eastern part of Afghanistan, Paktika province, for instance, or Hoz, uh, the floods that just happened, um, you know, uh, the, the issue of education, the issue of girls, uh, uh, women generally that Masuda has been uh, actively involved with, this support has poured out and we have been able to do it. I mean, we find, have found creative ways to send money to Afghanistan. Sometimes it's literally somebody going to Afghanistan and we give them cash and they, they deliver it. In other cases, we've been able to do it through MoneyGram or Western Union, for instance. In other cases, you give it to a family member here in the United States who has family there, and then they transfer it there. In a few cases, you have individuals who, who are trying to, in fact, create a service where they provide, where you give it here, they take a small percentage, and they give it there. So all of these have been mechanisms that we at Afghan Relief have used to send money, and it's been relatively successful. I mean, we run into headaches, we run into obstacles occasionally, but generally it's been successful. And it's, and it's made a tremendous difference. I mean, we've, we've fed hundreds, thousands, in fact, of, of widows uh, and orphans. Uh, we do this on a monthly basis. We've established wells, for instance, in remote communities 
to give access to water. I mean, all of this is done because Americans, people here in the U.S. have felt a real desire to help, not just Afghan Americans. I mean, but, but Americans generally have said, look, how can I help? There's a real interest in doing that. And so uh, this is, uh, is one of the ways they've done that. The ways they've done that. And I think it's a really good point. Um, I think everybody knows that's what, what, what the situation there is, it's not good. But I also think that everybody knows that there is a, a, a desire to help. And so I really appreciate people like you who are facilitating that. I think that the more that we specify that what this is what's going wrong, this is what's not going wrong, that right, it kind of, it's almost, I don't wanna say it's depressing because of course it's depressing, but if we focus on the positivity of a strong desire from Afghans and non-Afghans alike to help. And I really appreciate your facilitation of that help. I think it's gonna require leaders like you to have a platform like this to be able to say, hey, we all know it's bad, but here are the good things. People want to help and it doesn't have to come from the government. It's not yet necessarily USA driven. Individuals can help. So again, I appreciate your platform and I appreciate your time and efforts. We also, so next up, I will I would like to pass it on to a, a partner of ours and a professor at Occidental College. And sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Malik Moazam Dolat. I'm a professor at Occidental College uh, in the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice, where my work largely focuses on Middle East and South Asia, post-colonial, anti-colonial theory. Um, I've also Muslim Middle Eastern and South Asian communities in Los Angeles post 9-11. Um, and partnered with Muslim Public Affairs Council on a number of occasions, obviously. Um, I just have a, a brief few comments. Um, thank you for your uh, uh, incredible presentation and your work. Um, so um, I'm working currently with a group of veterans of the Af Afghanistan War, uh, Special Forces, um, who are trying to support, um, this will, I'll be very brief on this one, uh, trying to support a counter IED unit, an Afghani counter IED unit, who's currently being hunted by the Taliban. So they've successfully hunted some of them down, tortured them or killed them. And they're providing direct aid. It's a C3 called saveteam11.org. Um, they're providing direct aid to this unit and their family. So it's about 1,800 Afghans. And they have um, established uh, in their coalition with the Moral Compass Foundation um, in-country logistics that are very effective for delivering food, money, moving people to safe houses, uh, providing shelter for those families, their extended families. And that in-country um, logistics network validated um, has been very good at doing that. Um, that's one of the uh, things that I'm working on. That same organization, Safe Team 11, in coordination with the Moral Compass Foundation, um, has started a new project called the Education Underground. And what we discovered um, when we reached out for some of these um, counter IED forces when they got their SIVs done and they arrived in the United States was that we were able to get them uh, professional tools uh, so they could go about and build uh, a life here. Um, and we discovered that colleges and universities were willing to donate um, you know, lightly used computers. Um, and they would refurbish them for us um, and then put software on them and then we could deliver them uh, to these refugees so they could start you know, applying for jobs and be on the internet and all that. Um, and also learn coding and all of that. Um, we discovered that there was quite a bit uh, of you know, sort of computer donations that were possible. This new project, as I said, called the Education Underground. Um, we just received a, um, a set of computers, laptops, Chromebooks, actually, from Occidental College. It's been very generous. Um, and our goal is to clean those up, put software on them, educational software, science, literacy, and begin moving those through, for instance, groups like um, Heart, of, uh, Heart of an Ace um, and other logistics networks. Um, into Afghanistan, to the places, to the educational networks, sometimes themselves underground, uh, where they can be used for girls' uh, schools, uh, which are emerging. So that's, that's the main project that I'm working on there. Through Critical Theory and Social Justice, our department, we partner with two other groups, one called TIA, TIA.org, which is based in Los Angeles. They do direct service for refugees' families. And another that's brand new, very interesting one, called New Moon Jobs. Um, where they take Afghani refugees who have, you know, they were doctors or they were lawyers or they were professors, 
and they help them retool their CV so they can get professional, well-paying jobs in the United States rather than what happened to most of our families when they immigrated and had to start from the bottom of the ladder. Um, but the group that, um, the Education Underground, which is a new project, is um, we're, we're able to find computers. That's not a problem. We're looking for places to put them. Like who needs them? Who already has connections to schools? What kinds of educational software um, would be useful to have on them? So we're open to that discussion. If you want to contact us, um, you know my name, Adam at Occidental College, um, but also you can contact Thomas, like regular spelling, at saveteam11.org. Um, send an email there. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yes. I mean, obviously, I, you know, you and I have met a number of times. Um, and, and, you know, I, at the end of this, if you guys could uh, all send the information you have shared about the platforms that you all have, that way we can disseminate that to our partners here in Washington, D.C. And I, I just wanted to say one thing that came about our series of uh, meetings and events that we held last year is, you know, a number of Senate and House offices reached out to us to be able to hear more about what folks like you were talking about, including one that asked us to help write legislation that was introduced. So it's, you know, we can talk all day and all night and for months on end about the bad things that are happening. Everybody knows that, but it is folks like you who are providing platforms to provide, you know, benefit, to provide some kind of relief to the folks who need it the most. And so I appreciate all of your hard work. Um, I just wanted to drop that in there before we kick it to, uh, I guess, formerly our very own, but you'll always be one of us, Haris Thirin. Thank you so much, Mohammed, um, and thank you to the Muslim Public Affairs Council um, and my fellow panelists for this wonderful conversation. Um, uh, MPAC has really been one of the only American Muslim institutions that since the uh, fall of, uh, of Kabul or about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, has, has really continued to have a conversation about Afghanistan and the importance of it to, um, the, uh, to, to us as Americans and also the American Muslim community. I think, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about that. I'll take a step back. My colleagues so eloquently talked about some of the challenges, of course, humanitarian challenges and, and financial uh, challenges. Uh, but I'll take a step back and talk a little bit about why Afghanistan is important, why, why we should care. Um, and, uh, and and then talk a little bit about some of the ways we can potentially look at this issue, uh, because there are a diverse uh, set of views on how to approach of, uh, approach Afghanistan. Um, uh, I've uh, been involved uh, in um, the response to the to our withdrawal the, uh, as the United States from Afghanistan for the past year. Um, I spent uh, some time in Doha in the Middle East, uh, bringing, uh, helping evacuate, um, and then eventually here resettle uh, Afghans who were a part of our mission in Afghanistan for the past 20 years. Um, and so uh, it's been a bit personal for me. I, I'm all, I, am an, I am of Afghan descent. Uh, I was a refugee. My family left during the previous uh, um, uh, uh, conflict uh, that included the Soviet Union uh, when they invaded Afghanistan in 1979. And I was a young refugee who came to the United States. Um, and unfortunately, I saw that replay again um, when, when we left last year and hundreds of thousands of people who um, in a very dramatic scene left Afghanistan to try to find refuge in the United States and, and all over the world. So it's been quite personal for many of us who've been involved in this work over the past year. Um, but just to take a step back as to why Afghanistan is important, um, if we, uh, you know, especially as American Muslims, if we take a step back and we see why the war on terror started over two decades ago, was an incident that uh, unfortunately originated in Afghanistan. Um, uh, when 9-11 happened, uh, the perpetrators of that, uh, of that tragedy uh, were in Afghanistan and were given shelter in Afghanistan. And so the reason we went in as the United States was to, um, was to of course, dismantle Al-Qaeda, uh, to address 
the uh, terror that was being projected out of Afghanistan. And we spent 20 years uh, uh, in that process. We spent 20 years of American resources, of treasure, and also blood. Um, and then also Afghans partnered with, partnered with us in that process. So when we went into Afghanistan, we were not alone. It was the people of Afghanistan who had also suffered from terrorism and from uh, violent extremism and from extremism that stood with the United States, uh, that lost so many hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers, of policemen, of innocent um, uh, individuals around the country who lost their lives and gave their lives. Um, and what they saw was um, uh, a valuable mission of ensuring that Afghanistan does not become a place where it is able to threaten um, uh, its neighbors, but also the international community. And so the people of Afghanistan, to a large extent, really tried to support the mission of the United States. And so those who left, and I know there were some questions, those who left were individuals who supported that mission. Those who left were individuals who, in one way or another, really tried to support uh, the work that we did. Um, and, and, um, and, but of course, in that process, we made a lot of mistakes as a country, and so did the Afghans. Um, and, and so Afghanistan is, is an important and, and uh, is an important um, uh, place for us because when we try to forget Afghanistan, unfortunately, it continues to come back and haunt us. Uh, after the Russians left Afghanistan in 1989, we completely withdrew. Uh, we, con we withdrew our assistance, our engagement, um, and that also came back to haunt us. Uh, Afghanistan has been a center of international significance for a long time. It is, it is the place in the 80s where much of the international violent extremist groups were able to get involved in and, and, and kind of uh, make a basin. And uh, Al-Qaeda established itself in, in Afghanistan after that war, unfortunately, and so many other groups. And so as Farid mentioned, the past 40 years, over 40 years, the people of Afghanistan have suffered immensely because they did take on the responsibility of number one, supporting uh, us in the fight again in the Cold War. Uh, they did take that responsibility on and they were part of that process. And after they were abandoned. Um, and then they did, took also partial responsibility of, of supporting the um, uh, the fight against terrorism, and 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 uh, and also and and have for for two decades now, really tried to um, uh, support that process, but also establish a society uh, that uh, that is uh, democratic, that is viable, that is economically sustainable uh, as well. Many much of that, unfortunately, last year was lost. Um, uh, Afghanistan was not a perfect as a society. Um, there was a lot of challenges in governance and corruption. Uh, there was a lot of challenges um, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, terrorism um, and, and, and a lot of the regional countries did not help in that process either. Uh, whether that be China or Iran or Pakistan or Russia and some of the regional countries really um, did not support uh, in, in helping build a, um, uh, a sustainable uh, Afghanistan. So when we left, unfortunately that created a vacuum, a vacuum that the Taliban have, have taken over and filled. And I don't need to get into the details of that as Farid and the other panelists pointed out, there are challenges now with the Taliban and the role of the Taliban. But um, uh, there are a few things to consider. Number one, we as Americans, even though we left, at this point, we cannot abandon the people of Afghanistan. That is extremely important. We cannot repeat the same mistakes that were made post the Soviet withdrawal in 1989. Because if we do that, Afghanistan will, will once again become, unfortunately, a hub for those who have, have really um, nefarious goals around the world. If we take Afghanistan completely off of the grid and allow it to become a state that is run, whether it be a narco state, whether it be a terror state, whether it be a, um, a, a black economy state, 
Afghanistan will again be a center and a hub for nefarious actors from around the world who will come to use it as a launch pad for conflict in the region and for conflict in the international community as well. And we see the result of that in the past year, we've seen a rise unfortunately in violence in Pakistan. We've seen the Pakistani Taliban who are now uh, exerting themselves and saying, if, the, if we were able to do what we did in Afghanistan, we want to do the same thing in Pakistan. So number one, we cannot abandon Afghanistan politically as a country and as a people. We cannot abandon Afghanistan financially and economically. Um, and we cannot abandon Afghanistan morally. We have a moral responsibility. 20 years of conflict in that nation where we, you know, we engaged in, um, the people of Afghanistan have a moral responsibility on, uh, um, uh, on us to be able to continue that engagement. Now, how do we do that? If we're not going to completely abandon Afghanistan so that it becomes a hub for nefarious actors, how do we do that in a way that is safe, sustainable, and um, uh, uh, is, is a place that we make sure that our um, values uh, and our interests are protected? Number one, we have to develop, and this is something that we all need to be on the same page, in, same page on, we have to develop a, a sustainable means of supporting the Afghan economy. That has to be the number one, um, the number one priority here. And I'll tell you what, because if we don't do that, Afghanistan will either turn into a narco state or Afghanistan will turn into a failed state with a black economy that will allow all of the nefarious actors to take hold there. So we have to work with part, we have to work with the civil society in Afghanistan. We have to work with the regional actors, including China, including Pakistan, including Russia, including other folks in that region to develop a safe and secure mechanism to continue to support the people of Afghanistan economically and financially. That is the number one priority. If the people of Afghanistan in the next few years do not find ways to make a living, that narco state will come back. We already know that, that uh, even within the Taliban, there was, of course, there's the religious movement, but there was also the narco movement. There were the, the criminal syndicates. So many different interests that want to, that, have, that can benefit, that will benefit if Afghanistan is not supported from the international community. And, and I think, I think yeah. Just wanted to say, I think that what you had mentioned, allowing uh, Afghans to be able to make a living, I think that's a good transition into what Asma had mentioned about the app, where we are able to facilitate having any, a, a sustainable income for Afghans, where it's not just a handout, if you will, though those are also necessary. It's we are creating expertise by saying, can you, uh, you know, Asma, I think you had mentioned perhaps a carpet or some other kind of uh, trade where they feel like they're being empowered and it's not just a hand. Well, here, here's the challenge, Mohammed, right? The challenge exists here. The challenge exists in that for the past 20 years, 70% of the of, of Afghanistan's economy was an aid economy, right? So we 70, we, we spent 20 years, the international community, it, it was not just from the US, Japan, Germany, European Union, all of the, the international community supported the Afghan government, the Afghan economy. Uh, there was a dependent aid economy. Overnight, all of that was lost. Imagine losing 70% of your economy overnight. You receive none of it. The aid that we give in small measures, although it's important, is not going to be able to sustain the economy. There, and what we have to do is while we're, we, we have amazing um, nonprofits and charities, all of doing great work like Afghan Relief, we have to kind of shift and start to talk to our policymakers to those who are engaging on Afghanistan to create a sustainable means of supporting that economy that is not reliant fully on the Taliban, but that has the support of the UN, the support of the regional actors, because I think now the regional actors have come to a con the conclusion that, you know, we need to make sure we prop this economy up, this country up, or else that uh, the, the nefarious actors will all come back. And that's not good for the region. It's not good for China. It's not good for Pakistan. It's not good for Central Asian countries who are all afraid of 
the, um, the instability spilling over into their countries as well. So our language in the US, those of us in civil society, and also as American Muslims, I see this as an American Muslim issue as well, because we as Muslims believe in human rights. We believe in, in the issue. We've, so many American Muslims over the past 20 years have fought for equality uh, 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 on the issues of perception of uh, women in Islam, human rights, so many different things that we've worked on over the past 20 years, we have a stake in because if Afghanistan becomes a failed state, a place where women are oppressed, where uh, violations in the name of Islam and Sharia are committed, all of that will reflect on us as Muslim communities around the world. And we absolutely cannot, I, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I know that we are in the, in the interest of time. And I promise you, Haris, I could listen to you all day because I have spent, you know, almost a decade and a half living in DC in politics and policy. So this is stuff that I crave. Um, but just to make sure that everybody, uh, you know, who is listening is able to, um, you know, go back to what they were doing during the day. I, I just, one of, one of the reflections that I'm looking at or I'm kind of thinking about right now is that we have, we have got leaders who are using their expertise to help the issue. We've got leaders and you know, senior government officials like yourself, Harris, though of course this is not on behalf of your job or anything like that. And we've got folks who worked in um, you know, being able to provide platforms so that um, aid can be administered. And we've got leaders who are in the academic field and folks like Usma who are you know, future, future leaders already kind of like heading up efforts. And I, I, I'm just, I don't want to say optimistic is the right word, just given the gravity of the situation, but I am optimistic. And I am optimistic when I talk to folks in DC who also have a frustration that there is the appetite in terms of dollars wanting to be going to Afghanistan. How is it that we can make that happen? And so I appreciate all of your efforts that what you do, the platforms you have created, and God willing, we are going to get to a place where things are, are going to be better. And I think one of the things that I've heard as well is that when we talk about Afghanistan, it's always in this sort of doom and gloom narrative, and everybody knows it's bad there. It's not that anybody thinks that things are going well there. It's that if we focus on how we can build back better, not to use that from the uh, you know early Biden days, but how is it that we can actually help? How is it that we can tangibly person to person help? So to the uh, esteemed panelists, you guys are all experts at what you do. You're all amazing at what you do, and I sincerely I'm appreciative of your time because this is you know you you guys you guys have really busy days. I know that you guys have a lot of work that you're already doing. So I I genuinely. I appreciate y'all. And uh, with that, I think we can bid this uh, event adieu. And inshallah, we'll keep uh, we'll keep carrying our efforts forth. Thank you all.